I wish to welcome you to another lecture on neuroanatomy. We've been doing a series of lectures on neuroanatomy, and this one I've called it section eight, where we are going to look at the ventricular system and CSF circulation. Now, even though I've called it section eight, that does not necessarily mean that's the eighth lecture we're giving, but perhaps the eighth thematic region in the anatomy of the central nervous system. For those who've been following, we've done quite a number of lectures so far as outlined in the first seven. And so this is the eighth one that we are having. And the last theme will be the one on development and cognitive malformations of the central nervous system. So in this particular theme, we're just focusing on cerebrospinal fluid and CSF circulation as it flows through the ventricles and other sites. Maybe before we start in our objectives, something that is important to just highlight so that you're on the same page. You know, when you talk about ventricles, you might easily think that you're talking about the heart. When you talk about the ventricular system, in particular, we're referring to the spaces within the brain. It consists of a series of interconnecting chambers and cavities that are found within the brain. So basically, those are the brain ventricles. They are chambers or cavities which are interconnected. As you can see in this particular image, is outlined by that unique color. So from an embryological point of view, these chambers or cavities are derived from the lumen of the embryonic neural tube. Remember from neurulation lectures that uh, there's something called the neural tube, which is the primordium of the central nervous system. The neural tube has a lumen. That lumen is the one that gives rise to the ventricles of the brain. The ventricles are cavities, so there'll be a space inside and a wall. The inner lining, the inner wall of the ventricles consists of a layer of ependymal cells. In most cases, it'll just be a simple cuboidal or column epithelium, although the ependymal lining is slightly different from actual or true epithelium because it lacks the basal lamina. Either way, just look like epithelium. So the ependymal lining of the brain ventricles are the ones that are on the surface of these cavities. And the inside of the cavity contain a fluid that we call the cerebrospinal fluid. So that fluid runs within the chambers and the interconnecting channels. Now let's talk about the fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a clear and colorless fluid around the central nervous system. As I've already mentioned, it is found within the brain ventricles, but that's not the only place where we find CSF. As a matter of fact, there's more CSF within the subarachnoid spaces, and we also have CSF within the central canal of the spinal cord. So if you have to look at this, this is a central canal spinal cord. These are the subarachnoid spaces, both of the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, this is a ventricle, that's a ventricle, and that's a ventricle of the brain. Uh, at any given time, we can say that uh, in an adult, the volume of CSF is about 150 ml in an adult, total volume. Of this, about 125 will be found intracranially. So that means around the brain. And that means that 25 ml is found around the spinal cord, either in its subarachnoid spaces or inside. The pressure of this fluid is relatively constant to mean that the pressure there will be the same as the pressure somewhere there or somewhere there. And this is because the spaces are interconnected. And so the fluid flows freely between the spaces. And the normal 
um, pressure of cerebral spinal fluid, it's about 10 millimeters of mercury, well, plus minus a PO. The CSF in the subarachnoid space is quite more compared to the CSF within the ventricular spaces themselves. As a matter of fact, if you have to look at the cranial CSF, mm -hmm. I will find that 100 ml of CSF is actually within the subarachnoid spaces. 100. And so if you combine that with the 25, that is almost around the spinal cord, then we can say that close to 125 ml of fluid is actually in the subarachnoid spaces out of the 150. Of course, there's a slight error there because there's some little fluid within the central canal, kind of the spinal cord anyway, which we have to split that 25, but it's almost negligible. Now, what's the role of this cerebrospinal fluid? Because of that large volume of CSF within the subarachnoid spaces, the brain simply floats within that fluid. And so that provides buoyancy to the brain and the spinal cord. That's a protective mechanism so that in case of some rapid movement, the brain moves with the axial skeleton. And so it's not really struck onto the axial skeleton. Now that would only apply to some slight movement. Of course, if it's too rapid or a lot of force, there'll be some degree of injury, as we mentioned later, perhaps. Cerebrospinal fluid has a number of contents almost similar to the one in the plasma. Mm -hmm. um, this content may change in some various conditions which are pathological. And for that reason, CSF forms an important source of laboratory sample material in some disease conditions. For example, you may want to check if a patient has meningitis. You may want to look at CSF in terms of appearance and contents and many other investigations that CSF can actually form a sample of material to be used. With that in mind, I can now give you the learning outcomes of this particular lecture. So in this particular lecture, what do we need to learn? First, we'll describe the sources and composition of the cerebrospinal fluid. After that, we'll look at the way CSF flows through the various spaces, which are either in the brain or around the brain or around the spinal cord. We'll also look at the mechanisms and sites through which CSF is absorbed back into the bloodstream. We will take a few minutes to look at some common clinical conditions associated with the cerebrospinal fluid. And for the sake of completion, now that we're almost finishing anatomy, the central nervous system, I wish to take a brief uh, moment to just orient you on how the, the brain looks like anatomically when we image it with the standard images that we usually use. So let's look at the first agenda there, sources and composition of the cerebrospinal fluid. You may not know, but a lot of CSF is actually produced per day. We produce about half a liter of CSF per day. Now remember that uh, at any given time, the CSF spaces can only hold about 150 to perhaps 180 ml. Now that tells you something that CSF must circulate a number of times per day. If you look at that rate and bring it down to per minute, it will bring you to 0 0.35 to about 0 0.4 ml per minute. That is the rate at which CSF is secreted. Most of the fluid that is secreted is actually coming from what you call the choroid plexus. So choroid plexus contribute about two thirds of CSF. That is close to about 70% of CSF. Mm -hmm. Let's say something about this choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus look like this one. 
what you can see there. These are papillary-like or cauliflower-like growth or outpouchings of CSF secreting tissues that project into the lumen of brain ventricles. And actually it's all the brain ventricles, lateral ventricle, third ventricle, or fourth ventricle. So they are found in the flow and perhaps large components of the lateral ventricles. They're also found on the roof of the third ventricle. And they're also found on the lateral wall of the fourth ventricle. These are still choroid plexus and the lateral ventricles. That's one side and that's another side. Even this one, so these are cavity within the lateral ventricle, that's a choroid plexus. You can see the pendimal lining of the ventricle there. Histologically, this is how the choroid plexus will look like. So this is the cavity, this is the brain tissue, that's the pendimal lining. And so this is the plexus. We can see some lining epithelium and we can agree that's papillary-like in the whole structure. There's a core and a lining. The core of the choroid plexus consists of uh, a loose connective tissue that contain capillaries. So the capillaries will run within the core. And this, these capillaries are then lined by a pendimal lining, which you can see now here. So this is the pendimal lining. The capillaries will be at the center and the ependymal lining will be on the surface. When you look at these cells, the ependymal cells that surround the capillaries of the choroid plexus, we note that there are some several tight junctions between them. We also note that uh, they may have a lot of projections, as you can see there, villi and cilia, and we can also note, therefore, that even the basal side has a lot of invaginations. These are known characteristics for cells which are actively involved in ion transport. And so as a mechanism of secretion of CSF, there's a lot of ionic transportation taking place. In particular, sodium is pumped out into the lumen and with that then also chloride will follow and water will be pulled out. Now for that fluid to come there into those capillaries it means that there must be some arteries that feed them. The arteries that feed the choroid plexus are called choroidal arteries. The choroidal arteries that go to the choroid plexus within the lateral ventricle and third ventricle tend to arise from what you call the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid, as well as from several choroidal branches of the posterior cerebral artery. So those ones go to the choroid plexus within the lateral ventricles and also the choroid plexus within the third ventricle. In this image, we see the base of the brain there with the circle of Willis, and this is the anterior choroidal artery that feeds the vent, that particular choroid plexus. In this case, this is the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. We can also see the posterior choroidal artery there, which is now feeding again this one. Now remember, this is coming from the posterior cerebral artery, which is that one. The choroidal arteries that supply the choroid plexus within the fourth ventricle arise from the inferior cerebral arteries. It could be anterior inferior cerebellar artery or posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Apart from choroid plexus, are there other sources of CSF? Yes, we mentioned that choroid plexus contribute to close to 70% of CSF. That means that we need to account for the other 30%. We can account for the other 30% this way. The pendimal lining of the ventricles can still secrete CSF. And they do secrete CSF. So that applies to all the ventricles of the brain. 
but not limit to the ventricles. Remember the central canal, the spinal cord also has a lumen with the pendymal lining. So the pendymal cells that line the central canal, the spinal cord also contribute to production of CSF. Apart from that, we can also add another one. Now look at this image. So this is the central canal, the spinal cord there. These are the ventricles. And so those surfaces produce CSF. Other than that, we also have secretions from the arachnid membrane. Remember the arachnid membrane is basically one of the meningeal layers. We talked about dura mater, arachnid mater, and pia mater. And that the space between arachnid and pia is what you call the subarachnid space. So the arachnid membrane that form the boundary of the subarachnid space, the external boundary of the subarachnid space produces CSF as well. There are some secretions from the arachnid membrane into the subarachnid space. Last but not least, uh, we also have CSF that seep from the perivascular spaces. Now look at this image here. This is the pia mater. This is the arachnid mater, and we expect dura to be there. So these extensions are the arachnid trabeculations, which enable the subarachnid space to be a bit larger to contain CSF as well as blood vessels. So this membrane is the one that contributes to formation of CSF into this space. Now look at that blood vessel running within the subarachnid space, and we can see a branch of it entering brain tissue. As that branch enters brain tissue, there is some gap between the blood vessel and the pyre lining. That is what we call the perivascular space. So these perivascular spaces were described as somebody called Batch and Robin, and so we call it Batch Robin spaces. Fluid from the brain tissue can seep direct into the virtual robin spaces. And then that fluid can actually move into the subarachnoid space, hence contributing to the volume of CSF. That's an important route to note because it forms the route through which even white blood cells can use to leave the brain tissue there to enter the even proteins can use that truth. So very important to note. They have been described as specialized lymphatic channels of the brain. Uh, this image still captures the virtual robin spaces, but importantly also I want you to know that even though we have those spaces, the blood vessels that enter through these spaces are usually covered tightly by a number of structures and importantly, the food processes of the astrocytes, which then contribute what we call the blood brain barrier. So there is a barrier between the bloodstream and the brain tissue contributed partly by the astrocyte food processes. Now let's look at the composition of CSF. Um, so there are a number of components within the CSF, as you can see in the left table there. But importantly, I want you to understand also therefore that uh, if you are to compare the components of CSF and that of plasma, there are some things which are almost the same. For example, sodium is almost the same. And that therefore means that even osmolarity is almost the same. The osmolarity of CSF and that of, pro of uh, plasma is almost the same. However, there are some minor differences or major differences. And in this image, you can capture some of those differences. Importantly, proteins will be more in the plasma than in the CSF. Also, we note therefore that even potassium will be less in the CSF than in the plasma. 
some of those will be almost the same, like by carbon, it's almost the same. Glucose, uh, CSF will have less glucose than that in the plasma. So those are some of the differences that you may want to capture. All right, having talked about the source and composition of CSF, let's now talk about how CSF flows through various spaces. Before we narrate in detail how CSF flows in those various spaces, just an overview is this. That CSF will flow from the lateral ventricles and enter into the third ventricle and from the third ventricle flow into the fourth ventricle. So in this image, these are the lateral ventricles. This is the third ventricle and that's the fourth ventricle. And in this image, lateral ventricles, third ventricle and fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it will go to the subarachnid spaces. As CSF flows in that manner, the fluid mixes. Remember that the fluid comes from multiple sites. And even if it's choroid plexus, they are choroid plexus on multiple sites. So the fluid mixes. The mixing of CSF as well as its flow is facilitated by two major mechanisms. The ciliary activity of the ependymal lining of the ventricles, as well as the pulsations of the arteries that lie within the subarachnid spaces which contain the fluids. Think about that second one in particular. Think about an artery that is in systole. So when the arteries within the subarachnid spaces are in systole, what happens? They'll expand. And when they expand, the pressure that they put on the fluid pushes the fluid within the subarachnid spaces so that the pressure within the subarachnid spaces increases transiently. And that will push fluid away from the intracranial cavity generally. But during diastole, the reverse almost takes place again. So you may have this oscillating movements of the CSF that contributes to mixing. But generally, the ciliary activity will facilitate a particular direction of movement. Um, look at this image. So the arrow show, trying to show us how the fluid moves, but generally we've talked about from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, then to the subarachnid spaces. Despite the effect of body position, the fact that uh, you can be standing upright and so um, CSF will tend to be dependent. Despite that tendency for the fluid to be dependent or take lower positions, there's still a net slow bulk flow of CSF over the surface of the cerebral hemisphere. And this is usually in the direction of superolateral. So on the surface of the brain, there's a general superolateral direction of CSF flow. All right, so I've just given you a general overview, but let's look at uh, that in much detail. We've mentioned that uh, the lateral ventricles contain the choroid plexus. Now, other than the choroid plexus, we've also mentioned that there are other sources of CSF and they still apply in the lateral ventricle. So the CSF in the lateral ventricles is quite a lot because the lateral ventricles are large. These lateral ventricles are two. We have the right and the left lateral ventricle, and they are found within the cerebral hemispheres. Now, because we have two cerebral hemispheres, we have two lateral ventricles. We don't call them first and second ventricles, lateral ventricles. We call them right and left lateral ventricles. Each lateral ventricle has a number of parts. We have what you call the body of the lateral ventricle, which is this one. The body of the lateral ventricle largely lies within the posterior parts of the frontal lobe, as well as the parietal lobe. 
Then we have the horns of the lateral ventricle. There are three horns of the lateral ventricle. The anterior horn is also called the frontal horn. So that's the extension of the lateral ventricle into the frontal lobe towards the frontal pole. It well doesn't reach there. Then we have the inferior horn. The inferior horn is the extension of the lateral ventricle into the temporal lobe and is therefore called the temporal horn. And you have the posterior horn, which is the extension of the lateral ventricle into the occipital lobe and is therefore called the occipital horn. So that those three horns, frontal, temporal, and occipital horn, or anterior, inferior, and posterior horn. In this coronal image, that's the body of the lateral ventricle, but this is the inferior horn or the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. Now the three horns meet at that particular point. The point of union of the three horns is termed the ventricular entrum or the ventricular trigon. Sometimes we call it the collateral trigon. So you can call the ventricular antrum or the ventricular trigon or the collateral trigon. And it's almost the largest part of the lateral ventricle. That ventricular trigon is the largest or the widest part of the lateral ventricle. It also therefore houses the largest size of the choroid plexus. Most of the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricles will be found within the ventricular trigon. Now CSF from the lateral ventricles will flow away from it. But before that, let's see. In this particular image, uh, I'm showing you a coronal image of the brain and we see the body of the lateral ventricles, the right and left lateral ventricle separated by that thin membrane, which we call the septum pellucidum. This is the corpus callosum. That part of the corpus callosum is what we call the tapetum of the corpus callosum. These are the fibers which traverse through the body of the corpus callosum. And this lower thing there is the phonics. So this thin membrane connects the tapetum of corpus callosum to the phonics, separating the right and the left lateral ventricles, the bodies of the ventricles. This is an axial image of the brain, and we see the anterior horn, also called the frontal horn, and the posterior horn, almost at the level of the trigon, as you can see, it's wide there. So that's the right ventricle, that's the left lateral ventricle. In this particular drawn image, we see again that's the anterior horn is the body. This is the inferior horn, that's the posterior horn, and this is the collateral trigon. From the lateral ventricle, CSF flows to the third ventricle, as we'd mentioned. The connection between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle is termed the interventricular foramen. It's a very narrow channel that links the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. The interventricular foramen is also termed the foramen of Monroe. So we'd expect them to be paired because the lateral ventricles are two. We have the right and the left interventricular foramen of Monroe there and there, very tiny. Usually this ventric, these channels will be just below the phonics. As you can see, these are the phonics. And so this lateral ventricle, that's septum pellucidum. So just below that, the interventricular foramen to the third ventricle. And also these are interventricular foramen to the third ventricle. Where the pointer is right now is the third ventricle what do you notice about the third ventricle? It's just a midline slit. So you don't expect right and left lateral, sorry, right and left third ventricle. We only expect the third ventricle, which is a midline structure, it's a single one. It's a slit-like cavity centered within the diencephalon 
So it separates the right and left thalamus and the right and left hypothalamus. In this image, we can see that the lateral ventricle, the body, this is the third ventricle, this is the region, the encephalon. It is a thalamic uh, masses, basically. And in this image, we, this is the third ventricle. Remember, this is the thalamus. That's also the thalamus. These are the caudate nuclei. This thalamus, that thalamus is the third ventricle, the slit. From the third ventricle, how does CSF proceed? As we mentioned, CSF goes to the fourth ventricle from the third ventricle. Now, from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, CSF uses another narrow channel, which we call the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. This cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia traverses through the midbrain. Look at that image again. So this is the third ventricle, this is the fourth ventricle. This one here is the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia passing through midbrain. The cerebral aqueduct is a narrow channel. If you are to take a cross section through midbrain, this is a transverse section through midbrain, so that we see that this is the aqueduct, a very narrow channel, and therefore a common site of obstruction in what you call aqueductal stenosis or aqueductal atresia. All right, so that is the cerebral aqueduct. This image also shows you the midbrain. The one level three in this case is the cerebral aqueduct. And it is my hope that uh, having walked the journey of neuroanatomy so far, you are able to name those other structures in the upper midbrain and lower midbrain. Not the subject matter of this discussion, but uh, good to remember. Now we can talk about the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is a wide tent-like cavity that is found between the brainstem and the cerebellum. This is the fourth ventricle in that coronal image or this one in that drawn image and that one. It's found between the brainstem and the cerebellum. Maybe this is much better. So this is the space we are calling the fourth ventricle. You can see this is midbrain, this is pons, this middle of the this cerebellum. So this is the fourth ventricle. The flow of the fourth ventricle could be here. And this is the roof, superior roof and inferior roof of the fourth ventricle. In this particular image, we see that the fourth ventricle again, and we can use this also to follow the rest of the system. From the lateral ventricle, we move to the interventricular foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia to the fourth ventricle. So that's where we are, just behind brainstem in front of uh, cerebellum. It might interest you to know that the flow of the fourth ventricle is rhomboid in shape. And for that reason, we sometimes call the fourth ventricle the rhomboid fossa. On the floor of the fourth ventricle, there are a number of impressions that we see on the dorsal side of the brain stem. Very spectacular anatomy, not the subject matter of this discussion. But as you can see, there are a number of structures there. On the part of the pons and on the part of the medulla, we have the sulcus, which separate the right and left sides. Then just mid later to that is the medial eminence, which represents the motor column of the brain stem. Later to that is the sulcus limitants, which separates the motor column from the sensory column of the brain stem. Uh, facial colliculus represents the location of the facial nerve fibers as they arc the soul to the abducens nucleus. So it's a large impression there. These are some fibers. We call them the stria medullaris, some aberrant fibers. And 
Below that, we have the hypoglossal trigon representing where the nucleus of the 12th cranial nerve lies, and uh, the vagal trigon representing where the nucleus of the 10th cranial nerve lies. So anyway, it's very spectacular anatomy of the floor of the fourth ventricle. Remember that CSF has come all the way to the fourth ventricle. Now, if you are, I don't want to get lost, if you are to be asked the sources of CSF in the fourth ventricle, what will you mention? Remember the sources we talked about. So fourth ventricle has coral plexus, it will produce CSF. Fourth ventricle has a pendimal line, it will produce CSF. But in addition to those two, the other two sets of CSF in the fourth ventricle that's important to note. One is what we've already mentioned, that CSF from the third ventricle goes to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. But lastly, that the CSF from the central canal, the spinal cord, also goes to the fourth ventricle there. Remember, the central canal, the spinal cord, is lined by a pendimo, and so it also contains CSF. That's the central canal, the spinal cord. Great, so we've talked about how CSF flows through the ventricles, and this is the summary of it all from the lateral ventricles to the interventricular foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle, from third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia to the fourth ventricle. That's where we've reached. Central canal also drains to the fourth ventricle. These are the images representing the same, and we've already talked about them. So the lateral ventricles are those ones, the right and left one, anterior horn. This is the third ventricle, it's a slit in this one. Lateral ventricles, their body, and the third ventricle. This one shows us more, especially the fourth ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. Now, from the fourth ventricle, how does CSF proceed? From the fourth ventricle, CSF goes to the subarachnoid spaces. A subarachnoid space is a potential space that is found between the arachnid layer and the pyramata. Subarachnoid spaces contain cerebral spinal fluid, yes, but that's not the only content of these subarachnoid spaces. They also contain blood vessels that supply the brain. It could be arteries or veins. Also contain the nerve roots of cranial nerves, especially when they're near the brain stem. So those are the contents of the subarachnoid spaces. Now, for CSF to move from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space, there are three roots which are used. One is midline, and the other two, the paired thing that makes them two. So the midline one is this one. There's a median aperture of Magendi that takes CSF from the fourth ventricle into the subarachnoid space. We call the median aperture of Magendi or the median foramen of Magendi. Apart from that, we also have what we call the lateral foramina of Lushka. The lateral foramina of Lushka are paired. So we have right and left lateral foramina of Lushka. And that is the hole representing the lateral foramina of Lushka. So that makes them three because the lateral foramina of Lushka are paired. These are the channels that connect the ventricular system and the subarachnoid spaces. In some regions, the subarachnoid spaces are quite enlarged. A prominent subarachnoid space is termed a cistern. And there are a number of cisterns around the brain. In particular, I can highlight a few. That one there is one of the largest cisterns in the brain, actually the largest intracranial system, we call it cisterna magna, located between the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. So it's also called the cerebellum medullary system. 
it's a large subarachnoid space. There's also another subarachnoid space that's really large at this point. Maybe that image doesn't capture it nicely. Found in front of ponds, we call the pontine system. The pontine system is where even the bacilla artery will be running. This is obviously another system, as you can see. And that's what we call the interpedancular system. It's just in front of midbrain between the right and left cerebral peduncles. So the interpedancular system here contain a number of things, including where the circle of wheels is centered, also where the oculomotor nerves run. Then we have this one, dorsal to the midbrain. That's what we call the cystern ambience. The cystern ambience or the ambient system contain a number of things, including that vein that you see there, plus other things contained within the cystern ambience. So the aim is not to show you all the system, but to demonstrate to you that we have in large subarachnoid spaces, which are termed systems. I've mentioned some of them. Now CSF, which come from the fourth ventricle, goes to the subarachnoid space, but which subarachnoid spaces in particular? The CSF that uses the root of median foram magendi enters the cisterna magna. The CSF that uses the root of lateral foramen of Lushka goes to a region that we call the cerebellopontine angle. So the CSF spaces around the cerebellopontine angle receive the CSF, and then that connects to the pontine system which is in front of pons. So this is a pontine system. Maybe I show you that in a different way. So that the cisterna magna, this is the pontine system. This is cisterna ambience. This is the interpedancular system. This is the front of the brain stem and cerebellum. And so this region here is what we are calling the cerebellopontine angle. The aperture of the foramen of Lushka is just around there, as you can see in that image. And so CSF from the fourth ventricle come through this region, cerebellopontine angle, and then connect to the cistern in front of pons in this region, which we call pontine system where the right and the left will communicate definitely. So that tells you how CSF leaves the fourth ventricle to go to the subarachnoid spaces. Remember that the subarachnoid spaces are continuous with one another. They are interconnected. It is for that reason that the pressure of CSF is then relatively constant, irrespective of where you get it from. Again, because of this continuity, therefore, CSF flows through all the subarachnoid spaces because they're interconnected. And that is why, therefore, CSF will flow through the subarachnoid spaces around the spinal cord as well as subarachnoid spaces around the brain. Now, there's a large subarachnoid space which is on the lower part of the spinal cord around the lumbar segment, sorry, around the lumbar spine. Remember that the spinal cord terminates at uh, around L1, L2 junction in adults. And so around there and distal to that is a large subarachnoid space, which is termed the lumbar system. The lumbar system is the largest subarachnoid space, but remember it is not cranial, it is in the lumbar region. Otherwise, the cisterna magna is the largest cranial subarachnoid system. This shows you the lumbar system, that large subarachnoid space containing a lot of CSF. We've talked about how CSF flows. Now let's look at the site and mechanisms through which CSF is absorbed. Maybe before that, I'd mentioned to you 
that at any given time, the CSF volume is about 150 to perhaps 180 ml. I'd also mention to you that in a single day, we have about uh, 500 to 550, 60 there ml of CSF being produced. That tells you something that CSF must be absorbed at a really faster rate indeed, because it has to be replaced many times. Generally, 50% of the total volume of CSF is replaced every five to six hours. And so there are very effective mechanisms of removing CSF from the subarachnid spaces or otherwise other places. When CSF is absorbed, where does it go? It will primarily go to the venous circulation, which means venous blood around the brain. And this is usually by active diffusion as a result of pressure differences. What well, that means that the pressure of CSF, 10 millimeters of mercury, is higher than the pressure of the blood within the veins. And so because of that pressure difference, fluid from the CSF spaces will enter the bloodstream. Now, what are the sites of CSF absorption? Primarily, we have CSF being absorbed in what we call arachnid villi and arachnid granulations. And that will take CSF into the dural venous sinuses. We will talk about the arachnid villi and granulations shortly, but I want to mention other things first. Apart from the well-known site of arachnid villi and granulations, it is also been demonstrated that CSF can seep through the walls of the blood vessels next to the pyomata and the blood vessels in the subarachnid spaces. CSF can actually seep through into those vessels directly. Now that happens, uh, remember the blood vessels next to pyomata will receive CSF from the ventricles and the blood vessels within the subarachnid spaces will receive the CSF from the subarachnid spaces. That has been demonstrated to happen. And so it's important to know. Another one that has been demonstrated is through what we call the extracranial lymphatics. Now, this is based on the fact that the CSF that travel along the CSF spaces that surround nerve roots, for example, of uh, optic nerve or the olfactory nerve, the subarachnid spaces surrounding those ones, the fluid there will track through into the extracranial lymphatics. So that has also been demonstrated and perhaps believed to be an important source mechanism of CSF um, absorption, especially when the pressure is very low. All right, so these are the sites, but let's talk more about the arachnid villi and arachnid granulations because they're the well-known ones. The arachnid villi and granulations function as unidirectional valves. So they only allow CSF to move in one direction. Fluid cannot come from the veins back to the subarachnid space but fluid moves from the subarachnid space into the veins readily because of pressure differences. We have what we call the arachnid villi. The arachnid villi are microscopic, so you can't see them with their naked eye, but they are finger-like projections of the arachnid membrane into a dural venous sinus. For example, let's look at this the dural venous sinus. This is the subarachnid space. So we have some projections from the subarachnid space into the dural venous sinus, which we call arachnid villi. Then we have what you call arachnid granulations. Arachnid granulations are macroscopic. They can be seen with the naked eye. And they're believed to be conglomerates of the arachnid villi. They are aggregations or a mass of multiple arachnid villi. So they are conglomerates of the arachnid villi. And so their size usually increase with age. 
maybe a neonet may not even have them. But after some months or years, we see them coming up in the brain. And their number also increases as somebody grows. The size of each one also increases as somebody becomes older. They become macroscopic. They become more visible. They're just conglomerates of the villi into the durovenous sinuses. Now, with age, the arachnoid granulations may undergo calcification. And when they calcify, we call them uh, Paconian bodies. So this one shows you arachnoid granulations at the, along the region of the superior sagittal sinus. Remember, this is the median longitudinal fissure. So this is the region of the superior sagittal sinus where you see the granulations. Or even this one, these are granulations. Perhaps some of them have calcified around that region. Okay. Now, when these granulations uh, take CSF back into the bloodstream, the bloodstream that you see, the CSF is venous blood. Now, remember the veins around the brain run between the layers of the dura mater. So we call them dural venous sinuses, and there are many. Most of these granulations will be found within this dural venous sinus, within the superior sagittal sinus. Well, it may not be the only site where we have the, the arachnid granulations. Some of them have also been demonstrated even in the transverse sinus as well superior petrosal sinus as well as in the state sinus. But most of them are found on the superior sagittal sinus. And so superior sagittal sinus is the primary site or the main site where CSF enters from the subarachnoid uh, spaces. Next, we are going to go to some clinical aspects of CSF. Let's start with what we call lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is a procedure that is performed to have a needle access to the lumbar system. And there are a number of reasons why you may want to do a lumbar puncture. Perhaps you want to collect a sample of CSF for whatever reason, maybe for biochemistry or for microscopy. Uh, you're suspecting somebody has meningitis, you want to see which organisms are there. Other than for laboratory tests, we can also do lumbar puncture because we want to introduce some drug. For example, when performing spinal anesthesia, you do lumbar puncture. Why is it possible to anatomically perform a lumbar puncture? We mentioned this in some quarters, but you can repeat. One, we know that the spinal cord does not really extend the whole of the vertebral column. In adults, it ends at L1, L2 junction. And so we are safe knowing that uh, if you introduce the needle lower down between the third and the fourth vertebra, you are unlikely to injure the spinal cord. So that proximal cord termination is important to highlight. Also, the fact that we have a large subarachnoid space in this region, which we've called the lumbar system. It means that we have a lot of CSF on that particular region. So it's an important site where we can get the fluid. But last but not least, uh, remember the anatomic orientation of the lumbar spinous processes. They usually broader and pointing backwards instead of downwards. And so when you make a patient to bend slightly like this, the spinous process is actually widened and you have space where the needle can be introduced. So lumbar puncture is a needle access to the lumbar system to get fluid or to introduce drugs, whichever reason. Let's also talk about what we call hydrocephaly. Hydrocephaly is accumulation of fluid, accumulation of CSF within the brain ventricles. Now, don't confuse it with what you call hydranencephaly, which you, is a developmental disorder, and perhaps we'll talk about it more when you look at development and congenital malformations of the brain. Hydrocephaly is different from hydranencephaly. 
hydrocephaly is accumulation of fluid within the brain ventricles. What can cause hydrocephaly? Think about it. There are possibly three major mechanisms of causation of hydrocephaly. One, there is overproduction of CSF. And that can be because of some tumors of the coronary plexus, so this overproduction, or perhaps inflammation of the ependymal lining. And so there is some more secretions from the ependymal lining. Thus, inflammation could be because of infection, ventriculitis, or ependymonitis. Other than overproduction, we can also have obstruction to flow. Maybe there's obstruction in the aqueduct of Sylvia or obstruction in the foramen of Monroe, obstruction in the Lushka or Magendi foramina that will still cause hydrocephaly. And this obstruction can be because of many things, tumors, hemorrhages, uh, mass effects, whatever. The third major cause of hydrocephaly is impaired absorption. So this is something affecting the region of the subarachnoid space, arachnoid villa and granulations interface, which could be again, perhaps meningitis or even hemorrhages as well. So uh, you have a lot of blood cells accumulating those regions so causing obstructions there. Hydrocephaly is accumulation of CSF, excess accumulation of CSF within the brain ventricles. Uh, I want to give you a question based on that. And that's the question. Suppose we have obstruction at the level of the cerebral aqueduct. Which of these CSF spaces will be enlarged? So just say whether true or false. Will the third ventricle be enlarged? How about the fourth ventricle? How about the lateral ventricles? Think about foramen of Monroe. How about the subarachnoid spaces? And lastly, okay, I think I've repeated that so we can make one cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia. So which of those will be enlarged? I'm giving you 10 seconds to think through that and then we proceed. Right, I think you're good. Now let's talk about another concept still on clinical relevance of CSF. For you to understand this concept, you need to understand some basic anatomy first regarding optic nerve. So the optic nerve is a second cranial nerve. It goes to the eye. We usually consider it just an extension of the brain based on its height develops and the cells that cover it. But that aside, optic nerve is covered by pia mater, arachnid matter and dura matter. And the dura matter goes all the way to attach to the sclera of the eye. The sclera is the outer connective tissue of the eye, so it's continuous. As you can see in that image, the sclera, the outer connective tissue of the eye is continuous, the dura matter that surrounds the optic nerve. So there's a sheet that surrounds the optic nerve. What does that mean? If the sheet covers the optic nerve, it means that the subarachnoid space also follows through the optic nerve up to the eye. And that means that CSF also follows optic nerve all the way to the eye. Now, I hope you've gotten up to there. There's something else that I also want to tell you. There's usually a blood vessel which supplies the retina. We call the retinal blood vessels. So you have a terrain vein. The retinal vessels pass through the optic nerve. Well, it enters at some point, 
and then pass through the optic nerve. And in this image, you can see them there. This, this are the retina of their cells. You can go the central artery of the retina and the central vein of the retina, passing through the optic nerve to go to the retina or from the retina. So with that anatomy in mind, I want to think about a scenario. Suppose there is a raised pressure within the cerebrospinal fluid spaces. The pressure within the cerebrospinal fluid is raised. CSF pressure is raised. So there is a raised intracranial pressure. If there is raised pressure, there'll be a lot of pressure around the optic nerve as well. So first that will put pressure on the optic nerve. But in addition to that, that will also tend to compress the central vein of the retina. What are the implications? The implication is that uh, the point at which that vein exits the retina to go to the nerve, that is what you call the optic disc. The optic disc will tend to be dematous around the level of the the point of attachment there, the retina will be dematous around the level of the optic disc. That concept of uh, edema around the level of the optic disc is what you call papilledema. So papilledema is seen in situations of raised intracranial pressure. And we can use the degree of papilledema to estimate the degree or the grade of raised intracranial pressure. Papillary edema can be graded and can tell us how much is the intracranial pressure actually raised because of that concept. So remember that compression of the central retinal vein will impair venous drainage. And so even fluid will also be impaired from flowing back and that is why there'll be dim on the retina. That will be associated with some blurring of vision, of course, depending on the grade. The last thing I want to talk about in clinical importance is what you call counter-coup brain injury. Now, for you to understand what is counter-coup brain injury, you may also need to understand what is coup brain injury. Think about some trauma to the skull. If you apply trauma, sudden trauma to the skull, what happens? The CSF space between the point of contact, let's say this is the thing that is providing trauma. The CSF space between the skull or point of contact and the brain will be under compression. Now, if the trauma is too strong, you may actually have impact on the brain next to that point of trauma. And that bruising of the brain next to the point of trauma is what we call the coup injury. Now, remember there was some compression of CSF because the skull will tend to go away past while the brain will be lagging. Remember the fluid is here. We talked about buoyancy. Now think through physics at this point very clearly. If this place is under compression, this other side, there'll be a gap and a vacuum effect for that matter. How will that vacuum effect affect the movement of the brain. Brain will then be pulled suddenly towards that direction by that vacuum effect. And if the brain is pulled suddenly towards the direction because of the vacuum effect, this side of the brain can make contact with the skull on that end. And that is what gives you what you call a counter coup injury. The bruising of the brain tissue on the opposite, the side opposite, the site of trauma is what we call counter coup injury. So most injuries might tend to be counter coup rather than coup 
but if they are very strong, you will have both coup and counter coup injuries. Last but not least, I want to give you a brief orientation on how we study the anatomy of the brain in imaging. And I'll just use standard imaging modalities to orient you on the anatomy of the brain. As we do this, there's some things I'll expect you to do for you to be well oriented. I'll show you a series of videos of the brain, but this is what I want you to do. One, I want you to be able to state the plane from which that brain image was acquired. Is it axial? Is it coronal? Or is it sagittal? And those are the three options you have. Axial is horizontal. You know what coronal and sagittal is. Other than that, I'll want you to look at the appearance and especially the color of some of the structures that you'll be seeing. Which are these structures? In particular, I want you to look at bone. I'm hoping that you'll be able to orient yourself where bone is found. And remember the skull, usually the vertex of the skull has two cortical plates and a central region being a trabecular bone. We are particularly interested on the color of the cortical bone. So you look at the outer plate or the inner plate where that applies, or if the whole bone is cortical, fine. But my, I'm just putting emphasis that you're not looking at trabecular bone. You're not looking at spongy components of the, the skull. You're looking at the cortical components of the skull bone. What's the color? And two options I'll give you. Is it dark or bright? So it can either be dark or bright. Bright will mean white in this case. Then we escalate that slightly to something difficult. I want you to look at the color of gray matter. Now ask yourself where gray matter is found. Remember gray matter is found either on the cortex, and in this case, the cerebral cortex, so you can find gray matter there. But you can also find gray matter within the deep nuclei, the basal ganglia, or within the dencephalon. Now, for the sake of ease of uniformity, we can just focus on the gray matter that form the cortex. Remember that gray matter is very thin, usually two to four millimeters thick. Remember that one and it follows gyro convolutions. So we'll be looking at that gray matter, what's the color? We are comparing that gray matter with the white matter. The white matter can be the white matter just deep to that gray matter at the center of the gyri, or you can look at other white matter tracts, the corona radiator, the corpus callosum. Now, this is what I want to do between B and C. Just look at which one is brighter than another one. So you are comparing those two. Is the gray matter brighter than white matter? Or is the white matter brighter than gray matter? In all the images you're going to look at. Then you look at the color of fluid, the color of water. Now, Remember the water in the brain here will just be CSF. So you look at the color of CSF. For you to know the color of CSF, you love to look at where CSF is found, either in the subarachnoid spaces or within the brain ventricles. You need to look at where CSF is found. What color do you see? There are two options here. It can either be dark or bright, and bright is usually bright white in this case. Lastly, the other thing I want you to check is the color of the subcutaneous tissues 
the subcutaneous tissue, just the tissue just beneath skin, and that tissue usually contain fat. So basically, I want us to know how does fat look like on this brain images that we are going to look at. And again, you have two options. It can either be dark or bright. Lastly, I may want you to do something else a bit harder, but uh, important. How easy was it to distinguish between B and C? Was it easy or difficult? So the terminologies here is that uh, is the, there are well gray matter differentiation or there is poor gray matter differentiation. Or rather, let me put it this way, is there good gray white matter differentiation or is there poor gray white matter differentiation? Great. Now, with that in mind, we can start with this particular image. Now, it's a video I'm going to play for you. Remember, you are answering those questions. So let me start with the first one. In this first one, you can answer the first question, but I would suggest that you try to look at all of them, even as it plays. Okay, there it is, it is playing. I'm sure you've already picked the imaging plane. I'll not tell you that one, but I hope you've picked that easily. Now I want us to pick 2A. We can see that bone is bright. Let's try to relook at it to distinguish between B and C. But so far we can answer D as well. The CSF spaces are dark. You can see the lateral ventricles are darker. The subarachnoid space there is also dark. Let's try to look at gray white differentiation. Oh, there's something else we can answer. E, we can answer. Look at that space between skin and bone. We can see that uh, it's also dark. So, subcutaneous tissue, which is equivalent to fat, is also dark in this image. So, let's try B and C, and then we answer number three as well. Let me play it again. Perhaps I may arrest it at the best place that will help us pick that easily. I'll arrest it when it's at the vertex of the skull. That's why it's so some nice. Okay, look at that region carefully. Let me put that laser. So this is a gyrus. That is a sulcus. So the sulcus has CSF. It's a CSF cleft that is dark. So the dark is CSF cleft. These are subarachnoid spaces. Uh, this is a gyrus. So look at that gyrus again. We expect the periphery to be cortical tissue and the center to be white matter. So here we can say that the cortex is brighter than the white matter. In this particular image, the cortex is brighter than white matter. However, the gray-white differentiation is very poor. We are trying to say that a lot of difficulty. Picking the gray and the white, which one is brighter, is very difficult here. But if you're honest, you can see that this is brighter, that's brighter, and the center there, darker. The center is white matter. Now, in principle, when you look at images where bone cortex appear white, then most likely that imaging modality uses a radiation. And so don't think about MRI 
don't think about ultrasound. Think about CT scan. This image being sliced images, I don't expect you then to think about plain radiography or what you call plain X-rays. So this is CT scan of the brain. Great, that was the first one. The plane, I hope you captured it well. So it's an axial CT scan image of the brain. Let's try another one. So same questions, different image. The image is now playing. It's a slow one, so you'll be patient. The image is playing. Now we start to see the brain tissue there. You can start answering B and C between gray and white matter, which one is brighter? Okay, at that level, you can start answering 2D, what's the color of the CSF spaces. And at this point, you can also answer number one, what is the image plane? When it comes back, try to answer 2A and 2E. Look at the bone cortex. And remember there are two plates and then look at the subcutaneous tissue as well. Okay, I'm giving you a few seconds to make a commitment onto all of them. And then I'll give you a verdict. Okay, so bone cortex. First, the imaging plane is sagittal. Bone cortex is dark. Uh, you can see that plate there is dark and the outer plate there is also dark. Gray white differentiation. So gray matter is gray and white matter is white in this case, which means what? That white matter is brighter than gray matter here and that the differentiation is very good. We could actually see this is white matter and this is gray matter nicely. There is good gray white matter differentiation. CSF is dark in this particular image. So when we have good gray white matter differentiation, it is most likely an MRI image. To support that answer, in MRI, bone cortex is dark. And so I want to use those two major concepts to know whether you are looking at CT scan or MRI of the brain. Is good gray white matter differentiation and then bone cortex is dark. That is the MRI. However, there are different types of MRI, depending on the emphasis you want to put. I'll teach you only three for the sake of this particular lecture and orientation. There is what you call T1 weighted MRI. There's what you call T2 weighted MRI. And there's what you call flare MRI. T1 weighted. T2 weighted and flare MRI. In T1 weighted MRI, gray matter is gray and white matter is white. Fluid is dark. And that is what we are seeing at the moment. This is a T1 weighted MRI. Gray matter is gray. White matter is white, very important to remember that in T1 weighted MRI, the white matter is brighter than gray matter, as you can see in that region there. 
white matter is white, gray matter is gray. And then in T1 weighted MRI, fluid is dark, as you can see in the subarachnoid spaces as well as the ventricle there. So that is T1 weighted MRI. Usually T1 weighted MRI will give us the normal anatomy of the brain. And in this particular image, remember this is sagittal image. So this is a sagittal T1 weighted MRI of the brain. In T1 weighted images, uh, fat will be bright. And look at that fat tissue there, very bright there. Okay, let's try another one. So this is another one. So the questions remain the same, but the image is different. So this is a quicker one. It's already playing. You answer the questions. Relatively straightforward because we've taken time to explain the previous one. So I hope you've settled on it being coronal image. And after analyzing everything, I hope you've settled on it being T1 weighted MRI image again, except now coronal, T1 coronal image of the brain. Let's try another one. So starting from the vertex of the brain there, what do you see? Very bright fluid signal spaces. And these are the gyri. So we already know that fluid is bright. How about the white matter compared to gray matter? Which one is darker? What about the bone cortex? What's the color? What about fat? Now, most importantly, in that image, I want to pick two key things. I want to pick that the gray matter is brighter than the white matter. Look at the core, the core in, in the corona radiator there. White matter is dark, gray matter is brighter. In addition to that, I want to pick that the fluid signal is bright. Having noted that bone cortex is dark, this is MRI. So this MRI image is what we call T2 weighted MRI. In T2 weighted MRI, we have fluid being bright and we have the gray matter being brighter than the white matter. White matter is darker. Now the terminologies used for MRI color is signal intensity. So we say that the white matter here is hypo intense compared to the gray matter, the cortex. The cortex is hyper intense compared to the white matter. We can also say that the fluid is hyper intense. The ventricles are hyper intense. The term used in MRI coloring is intensity. So hyper intensity, hypo intensity. Well, the, the comparison is usually the cerebral cortex. So cerebral cortex is iso intense because it is the, 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 the baseline. So anything brighter than the cortex is hyper intense and anything darker than the cortex is hypo intense. So in T2 weighted image, Fluid or CSF is hyper intense to the cortex. White matter is hypo intense to the cortex. Another one. 
very unique. It might confuse you, but look at the gray and the white matter again, still MRI because bone cortex is dark. Look at white matter and gray matter first. Then make some distinction before you proceed. So when you look at the gray and the white matter here, we note that the white matter is darker than the gray matter. In other words, the white matter is hypo-intense to the cortex. And that qualifies it to be still a T2. However, it is not the regular T2 because in the regular T2, we would expect fluid to be bright. But in this case, fluid is dark. The subarachnoid spaces are very dark. The subarachnoid spaces are hypo-intense. When we have a T2 image with hypo-intense fluid signal, we call it T2 flare. Or you can just call it flare. Flare is F L A I R. It is an abbreviation, stands for fluid attenuation inversion recovery. Fluid attenuation inversion recovery. So, so it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an MRI sequence that is used to null this bright signal from fluid to enable us to see some pathologies in the brain. So anyway, this is a flare image of the brain. Now let's make some conclusions. I'm presenting you with some images. The first one is sagittal, the second one is axial, and the third one is coronal. Is this MRI or CT scan? If you settle for CT scan, do you think it has contrast or doesn't have contrast? Now, how do you know whether it has contrast or not? You know it has contrast if the blood vessels appear brighter because there's some drug that has been injected into them. If you've not settled on CT scan, you settle on MRI, then I want to know is it T1, is it T2, or is it flare? Remember the things that I said you use to distinguish those three. Okay, I'm waiting for you. I hope you've settled on it being a T2-weighted MRI of the brain. So sagittal, axial, and coronal T2-weighted MR of the brain. I'm calling it plain because there's no contrast and because there is no nulling of fluid. So just call it T2. You can call it plain T2 or just T2-weighted. Another one. So is it CT scan or MRI? If CT scan, is it contrast? or without contrast? I mean, is it contrast enhanced? It doesn't have contrast. If it is MRI, is it T1, T2, or flare? Okay. I hope you settled on plain T1-weighted MRI images. And the plain here simply means that there's no contrast. Now, usually we do contrast enhancement using a drug called gadolinium on MRI images. And those ones are usually routinely done on T1 images. So if you have a T1 with contrast, we'll be seeing some brightness within some blood vessels. We don't see them here. So these are plain T1 weighted. It doesn't have contrast. Again, sagittal, axial, and coronal images. Okay, this is another one. So here, is it 
CT scan or MRI. If it's CT, is it with contrast or without? If it's MRI, is it T1, T2 or flare? I hope you've settled on CT. Now, this CT is a non-contrast CT image. Why do we say so? Look at the bone cortices. They're bright, that tells you it's CT anyway. Uh, radiation has been used. Um, the terminology used for coloring in CT is density. So if it is bright, we say it's hyperdense, like this bone is hyperdense. And if it's dark, we say it's hypodense. So don't confuse density with intensity. Density is used for uh, radiation acquired images and intensity used for MRI acquired images. Echogenicity is used for ultrasound acquired images. Okay, so this is CT because bone cortex is hyperdense. And uh, maybe you've noted that there's also some calcification within some intracranial structures. Again, that tells you hyperdensity in those calcifications. That's calcium. Uh, this CT does not have contrast. When it does contrast, you'll see some blood vessels lighting up within the subarachnoid spaces. So it's non contrast. How about this one? Crack your brain a bit, a bit, but I'll tell you. So first, you're trying to find out where you are. You have no idea where you are. When you look at some images and you don't know what you're looking at, it's most likely ultrasound image. So this is cranial ultrasound image. We do cranial ultrasonography on neonates and infants before the anterior fontanelle closes. And this image has been acquired through the anterior fontanelle. So this one has been acquired in the coronal. Uh, the, it has been angulated anteriorly. So we see the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles. And these are the, this is the frontal lobe actually. And this one has been acquired in the sagittal plane through the anterior fontanelle. Again, this is the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricle there. This is the coded, that's thalamus. And this one has been angulated slightly posterior. So these are the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles. And so this is the occipital lobes, basically. So it's still coronal, but posterior. This is coronal, but anterior. And then this is sagittal. These are ultrasound images. Great. With that, I think I'll now conclude my lecture. So we've looked at uh, CSF circulation, but we've also looked at how we identify different images of the brain. Thank you very much. So the last session in the neuroanatomy sections will be on development and congenital malformations of the brain. You can check out on that one. Thank you.